Good evening, everyone, and on behalf of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, welcome to the final session of Looking in the Mirror. Cooperstown reflects on racism with today's focus on taking action. My name is Leanne Hirabayashi, and I have the pr privilege and honor of co-moderating these sessions. Thank you all for joining us tonight. This series is a, is a response to the murder of George Floyd and the nationwide protests that erupted in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. The goals of this series are to examine how racism affects our community and institutions, learn how we can confront bias and inequities at a local level, and identify actions that we can take as individuals, groups, and a community to address racism and create a more equi equitable Cooperstown. And as I said earlier, this is that last of the panel of discussions in this series of a total of seven. Let me just go over a few items related to logistics and format of this panel discussion. There will be a couple brief messages from the host and sponsor of the session. Then I'll introduce my co-moderator and our distinguished panelists after the introductions. Each panelist will make a brief presentation if there are presentation specific uh, questions from the audience or other panelists, we'll address them right after that presentation. Um, then we'll have a question and answer session, which will be handled by my co-moderator, Joanne Gardner, for attendees. And it looks like so far we're up to about 25. Um, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see several icons in a bar that's similar to what I'm showing here. So please note that chat is disabled and we're not going to be using the raise hand feature, just that Q&A tool. Um, if you have a question, just click on that Q&A icon there and uh, send, send that question in and you can please feel free to send it in at any time. Uh, and uh, make sure that if your question is specific to one of the panelists, go ahead and, and identify that panelist. Otherwise, we'll assume the question is for all panelists. Um, Joanne, will be moderate, uh, monitoring that Q&A tool and asking questions on your behalf. And please note, we may not be able to get to everybody's questions and I appreciate your understanding on that. Finally, um, these discussions are being recorded and a link to each recording will be made available on the Friends of the Village Library webpage. So just a brief message from the organizer of the panel discussion on the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown. Uh, this, uh, this organization, the Friends of the Village Library, works closely with the library to sponsor educational and entertaining programs um, for the Cooperstown community. This series, Looking in the Mirror, Cooperstown Reflects on Racism, is an expansion of the annual Sunday spe speaker series scheduled from October through May. On the Friends of the Village Library's website, uh, you will find a list of resources on racism and uh, which will include recommendations and information provided by um, the panelists um, from the past and also tonight. The League of Women Voters of the Cooperstown area is grateful for this opportunity to sponsor the Friends of the Lib Village Library Looking in the Mirror series with its goal of providing a forum for discussing racism at a local level and identifying ways to change our community for the better. Serving the people of the Cooperstown area, including the village of Cooperstown, the towns of Otsego, Middlefield, Springfield, and Hartwick, and surrounding towns in northern Otsego County, we are a nonpartisan political organization. Um, the League encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy through education and advocacy. To find out more, just go to our website, lwvcooperstownarea.org. So let me introduce you to the people you'll be seeing this evening, starting with my co-moderator, uh, Joanne Gardner. So currently on leave of absence from her position as a licensed teaching assistant, Joanne is on the board of the Cooperstown, Oneonta, and Otsego County Film Partnership. Namita Sugandi is assistant professor of anthropology at Hartwick College. Her areas of expertise are non-state complex societies, South Asian archaeology and micropolitics, ceramic analysis, origins of the Brahmi script, heritage management, and decolonized strategies of archaeological practice. Namita received her PhD from the University of Chicago. Paula DePerna is a writer and frequent media and conference speaker on a variety of subjects. She has served as president of the Joyce Foundation, as well as vice president 
for Recruitment and Public Policy at the Chicago Climate Exchange and president of CCX International. Prior to these positions, Paula served as writer and vice president for international affairs for the Cousteau Society. She's currently a columnist for Women's Advisor Forum and Forbes.com, as well as special advisor to the Carbon Disclosure Project. Paula has also served as a consultant to numerous national and international organizations. Mary Bondaroff is Interim Vice President for Student Affairs and Chief Diversity Officer at SUNY Morrisville as College Administrator, Student Affairs Professional, Diversity Educator, and Student Advocate. Mary has developed a reputation as someone whose students, faculty, staff, and administrators can trust with the skills to navigate difficult political environments to build bridges for change. Mary is committed to providing leadership that impacts uh, institutional change so that historically underrepresented communities thrive, not just survive the institution. Mary's research uh, focus, in, her research interests focus on how black and brown uh, students make sense of their experiences on a historically white college. The combination of both scholarship and applied learning has helped Mary develop her strong skills grounded in research. Michelle Osterhout is the principal of Perry Brown Intermediate School in Norwich with almost 20 years of classroom experience. Uh, she's well-versed in creating standards-based lessons and using technology in the classroom. Michelle is active in civil rights work within her community and serves as the vice president of the local NAACP. And she is proud to be the first American, African-American council member for the city of Oneonta serving the fourth ward. As an educational professional, she collaborated with Glimmer Glass Festival in Cooperstown and Dr. Eddie Francisco Alvarez of SUNY Oneonta, creating grades six through 12 draft ELA curriculum for the original libretto stomping grounds by Paige Hernandez and Victor Simonson. Michelle is an SDB associate and doctoral student at the University of New England. Caridad Fuertes is the Section Chief of Breast Imaging at the Bassett Medical Center. She is originally from New York City of Cuban heritage. Carrie did her undergraduate studies at Colgate University and medical school at Boston University. She initially did an internal medicine residency at St. Luke's Roosevelt in New York City and a second residency in radiology at Albert Einstein Montefiore Medical Center. She did a fellowship in breast imaging at Yale University. Carrie came to Bassett in 2006 as a general radiologist, becoming section chief in 2013. She lives in the village of Cooperstown, where she and her husband have raised two daughters. Lynn Mabus is an educator and community and political activist. As a member of the board of both the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown and the League of Women Voters of the Cooperstown area, Lynn created the idea for the Looking in the Mirror series and chairs the committee that developed and implemented the programs. Prior to moving to Cooperstown in 2000, Lynn worked for 15 years at a national nonpartisan civic education organization, promoting informed participation in the democratic process. She's held various positions in the areas of curriculum and instruction, program development, and fundraising, and she's a graduate of the College of William & Mary with a degree in history and government. Currently, Lynn volunteers for numerous community and political organizations and works on the education staff at the Farmers Museum and Fenimore Art Museum, and as a substitute teacher at Cooperstown High School. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna stop my share and uh, we'll go ahead and begin with our panelists. So why don't we start off with Namita. So Gandhi, why don't you take it away? So I hope you can all see my screen. I just started that share. Um, but good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and I think I've been tasked with summing up our series. And I think the way to do that was to start with how it began, which was as a discussion amongst uh, several of us in Foval in response to the protests against police violence and the Black Lives Matter movements of last summer. And I think many of you know Foval as an organization that helps to promote the library. And we run the book sale and we sponsor a Sunday speaker series. And once a year, some of you get a letter from us asking for donations. Um, but as individuals and members of the Cooperstown community, we felt like if there was something that we could do to address issues of racism, that we should try. 
Um, but we very quickly in our discussions, well, I'm trying to jump ahead to my next, there we go. We very quickly realized that many of us needed to start with some very basic definitions and understandings, beginning with the idea that race is a social construct. It's not a bio biological reality, but racism is real. And there are a lot of resources available that cover this type of material. But even this stuff wasn't enough for us. It was about understanding what racism is. It wasn't enough to become anti-racist. Um, so that really kicked off a longer discussion that we had about why racism and ideas about race persist, even though we've known about the social construction of race for a very long time. And so this discussion brought up a lot of things about culture and inequality and, and privilege that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And there's a lot of things that we could sort of unpack and, and consider from these discussions, but I really wanted to highlight the last two. Uh, the last two points here. And the first one is that racism hurts all of us. And the second is that we can learn to be anti-racist, but it involves more than just educating ourselves. And I think that was really the big first leap that our group needed to make. We needed to recognize that addressing racism in our community is not a simple matter of reading a few books or watching a few online discussions. It's a start, but it's something that really requires an active and sustained effort. And that's something that can be uncomfortable. And that's something that people don't always want to do. So that's when we began this series with the help of the League of Women Voters. Um, and again, we realized that this is only a beginning and we're really hoping it's just the first steps of a broader initiative. But we really needed to begin with an honest look at our community and some of the major institutions that shape our community in Cooperstown. Um, so really, you know, our purpose was to start a discussion, to think about what's already being done and then to think about what still needs to be done to address racism in our community. So as you can see, we had six, six panels where we invited leaders and community members associated with different institutions to talk about issues of racism and diversity. And I think we had a lot of really wonderful discussions. And if you missed any of those, the recordings have been posted on YouTube and you'll find those links on the FOVL page on the library website. But what do we learn after six panel discussions about racism in our community? <laughs> Ooh, we've got racism, right? Racism is here, it is all around us in Cooperstown. Often it is so ingrained, we don't even notice it. We've got institutionalized racism, the kind of racism that's built into our institutions through policies and rules and just a basic lack of understanding. We've got internalized racism, those unconscious biases and judgments that many of us have about people who are different from us. And we don't always recognize these biases. Right. So uh, another thing we learned, I think, is that issues of race and racism are uncomfortable to talk about, but it's important to have these conversations and discomfort is necessary to facilitate change. And that was a point that came up a lot in our panel discussions. And I think related to that, another point that needs to be added is that to stay silent is to be complicit. And I think this brings up the issue of privilege that I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. And I think it's really important for all of us to think about how when we talk about issues of social inequality, whether it's gender or race or any other category, we often put the burden of addressing those issues on the people that are most disenfranchised by those issues. And I think that's something that needs to end. Um, but you know, as we heard, Cooperstown is doing some things to address these issues already. So we have conversations happening in our community and there are individuals that are working to increase diversity and addressing issues of racism in Cooperstown. However, you know, we also learned it's not enough. And a lot of the people of color who live here and the people of color who visit here have individual experiences of racism. And that's really the stories that came out a lot during our panel discussions that highlighted how racism in our community is experienced and manifested by individuals. But another thing that was also often emphasized was how change can and should come from institutions, right? It should start at the top with policy changes. And I think this point often brought us back to that idea that addressing racial discrimination and racism in our community requires a change in culture. And that can be uncomfortable and that can be something that people are resistant to. 
And it's not always a fear of conflict or change or something, you know, sometimes it's just an issue of apathy. And for some people, racism might not seem as much of an issue compared to areas that have more diversity or compared to other issues that impact our community because we have those two. But again, whether we recognize it or not, racism impacts everyone in this community, even if you're not a person of color. Racism hurts all of us, right? It's, it's bad for our community. How is it bad for our community? It's bad for our demographics in an increasingly diverse America, right? And this is bad for our kids. Cooperstown should not reflect 1950s America. It should reflect 21st century America. You should remember the 1950s weren't that great for a lot of groups of people, right? And we should keep the historic preservation to our architecture, maybe. But this has a huge impact on the lives of residents, particularly the younger generation, that needs to be prepared to deal with the 21st century in America. But people of color don't want to settle here, and people of color don't always want to visit as tourists. And that brings us to the second point, which is it's bad for business, right? And we can talk about how baseball is a diverse sport, but how our tourist industry largely caters to one demographic, and it's a shrinking demographic, right? And a single negative encounter can ruin someone's experience. We heard about that during our panel discussions. And that means that that person will not return and they might warn other people about visiting. So we can make jokes about racism and the lack of diversity in this region, but they're not funny when you think about the impact on the businesses around here. Right. And that's sort of my third point, which is this is bad for healthcare. And there's a lot of data out there about the impact of racism on health and healthcare outcomes. And we heard a lot about that during our panel discussions on healthcare. So this is the second largest industry in our community. And, and as we learned, racism creates problems in the hiring and retention of staff, but more significantly in, in terms of patient treatment and outcomes, right? And there is a lot of data supporting this. So racism in our community hurts our entire community. That's the most important lesson, I think, to be learned. So I guess to conclude, I think it's great that we had this series and I'd really like to thank all of our contributors, everybody that participated in this series and who joined in, um, and especially all of the people who are doing this work already to promote racial equality in our region. But we looked in the mirror and what did we see? We saw racism, right? And that's not something to congratulate ourselves about. Um, and again, this is something that should matter to everyone in this community because it negatively impacts every person in this community, regardless of color and regardless of whether they recognize it or not. So this is when we can start thinking about the actions that we can actually take. Um, and I'd like to turn things over to our, our next set of speakers who are gonna speak a little bit more about some of the concrete steps that we could take in our community to improve things. But before I turn it over, I'd like to announce a short survey that our group has put together. Um, and it's really meant to collect some feedback about this program, but also to get the names of people who are interested in getting more involved and sort of working with us on the next step. So you can access that survey on this website at the address that you see on this slide right here. Or if you have a QR code scanner, um, you can scan that code. Um, and that should bring you to this survey and we'll, we'll advertise this again. So if you don't get it right away, um, you can access it, that again. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so Paula, you wanna take it away next? Go ahead and unmute yourself, Paula. Hold on. That happens 99.9% .9 of the time. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Namita. I was saying that was a terrific summary. And really, thank you to Lynn and the Friends of the Village Library for putting the series together. I managed to see almost all of them, and they were very edifying and inspiring. And I'm very happy and proud to be part of this panel, taking maybe it a bit further. <clears throat> so I just was going to talk about three levels of my action. Um, how I'm trying to re respond to the realities that Namita uh, beautifully outlined. Um, just in, in terms of um, my personal discretionary time, uh, I have kind of decided since the George Floyd murder, but before also, that I had huge gaps in my uh, understanding of things with regard to race, though I felt I had some knowledge that was pretty significant too. And um, I became involved with a group that I had actually given the, its first grant to 
20 years ago when I was president of the Joyce Foundation because it seemed like a good idea. At the time, I had no idea how important it was. It was a good idea. I gave them a small grant from my discretionary fund. And 20 years later, it's uh, still here and it's called the History Makers. And I'm now on their board and we're trying to raise uh, significant capital funds for, to celebrate the 20th year of their uh, existence. And what is it? It's an oral and uh, video archive of interviews of African-American leaders in every sector of our society, finance, politics, sports, arts, music, law, um, a whole group of pioneers that I had never heard of, hardly any of them. And I would su suspect that most people have not heard of many of most white people or non-African-Americans and probably many African-Americans too, because these are people who are excluded from our, our history books, but who nevertheless were pioneers, experts, prize winners, making huge contributions, leaderships and achievement. And I just, um, it, it, it's a curriculum, it's, a, it's a housed permanently at the Library of Congress. Maybe we can link it up at the Friends of the Library, but it's a tremendous resource, but very moving, very, very moving. And just to give you a little bit of an example of what they do, uh, lots of people probably saw that amazing movie history, uh, The Hidden Figures, about the three women who helped uh, in the Merc, who not helped, who particularly uh, um, Catherine Johnson, who helped, uh, uh, do, who did the math that got uh, uh, Alan Shepard to, uh, John Glenn rather, to go into orbit. And John Glenn wouldn't go until she verified the numbers. Well, History Makers has an interview with the, with the real Catherine Johnson. And, um, you know, students who are studying science, space, racism, whatever, can go on History Makers and see the real Catherine and then see the movie. But anyway, that's, that is something I'm very proud of being involved in, and it is part of my use, as I say, of discretionary time. Uh, fast forward, and you know, it's an action, it's something I can do. And I guess picking up on Namita, um, you know, what I've learned from uh, all these panels is we gotta step up, people have to step up. And that inclusion is not only about race, it's about anybody who feels excluded. That, you know, if you, if you see someone and you think that person is feeling excluded for whatever reason, there's a question mark there. And um, um, inclusion has to also include people who feel left out socioeconomically. And uh, uh, Cooperstown has had that kind of a problem in the schools for some time. Children of doctors didn't talk to children of non-doctors, things of that nature. So there's, there's gotta be a lot of healing. But um, fast forward to the vigil that we had uh, for the George Floyd mur murder, and I don't know, 900 people were at the uh, court, uh, the the the, the uh, yard, the front front lawn of the courthouse, and a number of us started talking uh, about precisely something that Mita mentioned: that there's no coordination among the institutions on the topic of race in this area. So we started talking about how we could address that absence of coordination. And so a number of us came up with this loose idea, which is now coming more into shape, called the Otsego Inclusion Hub, which will be, we hope, a website. And we've been having steering committee meetings, including conversations with Bassett, with, with the Glimmerglass Festival, with the Chamber of Commerce, with some representatives of the school district, uh, informally with uh, all kinds of groups, including with friends, to uh, see if we can uh, get that website up and running. And basically the idea of it is sort of threefold. It would serve specifically three purposes. One is a welcome site. Anybody who is permanent residents, not for tourists, um, can use this and will find interesting things there. So the first set of things they might find are resources. Um, events, more than a calendar, but resources that speak to some of the issues that we're going to be talking about tonight and that Namita highlighted. The second, um, let's call it window, would be the policies that are in, per in place in this community. That if you feel unwelcome or you feel you've been discriminated against, uh, uh, you can find out what the policies are and what the remedies could be. And um, you, you know, that, that, that this is the community you have come to, and these are the official values of this community. And therefore, we're making a statement about what is our ideal set 
of values. And the idea of that, of course, is that people who feel excluded will feel a little fortified and be able to maybe make another step or get some help. And then the third part would be uh, a kind of camaraderie section where people could connect with uh, individuals who might be in the same boat, who might be a buddy, a buddy system. Again, the idea of expanding the community, breaking down the sense of exclusion, and also linking and more coordinating these efforts. Now, of course, large institutions like Bassett and the school district, they have structures uh, that uh, that uh, are, are more strong, but the informality of the community is also very important. And there's so many civic groups and we all need to be working somewhat together. And then the third category of actions, which I'm sure will come up and a friend of mine gave me some of these ideas, I have to confess. But you know, there's a lot of smaller, quote, smaller things we could be doing from joining organizations you might not have thought of, one might not have thought of joining, the NAACP white person joining that, um, Asian, Asian American Association. Should I join that? Contribute, learn what they're doing, make an effort to read books by people I feel are excluded or going to movies by people I thought I feel might be excluded or listening to music that I wouldn't normally go to automatically. All of that outreach. Um, you could also um, make donations to these organizations. And another thing, which I think Mary is gonna talk about, but I've noticed myself now that I'm looking in the mirror, walking around town, I often see people that I didn't see before and um, who I think are quote new or they're new to me. Cause of course, you know, just cause I don't know them doesn't mean they're new, new, but I am making an effort to say hello and smile and just some kind of gesture that says, I see you and you're welcome in my life. And so those are the three things that I'm trying to work on. And um, I'm so grateful that we had that vigil and I'm so grateful that, that we've taken on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, and uh, Mary, you wanna uh, go next? Sure. Thank you everyone for being here. I. Um, have a PowerPoint because that's how I work. <laughs> um, let me just start from the beginning. So uh, I'm hoping to sort of talk a little bit about some things for people to think about when you're framing this work and your self work um, as a white person to be, um, you know, from my perspective, I've been in higher ed for over, over 30 years doing work with students of color on um, SUNY Oneonta's campus and SUNY Morrisville's campus for longer than I'd um, care to speak to. Um, but this is a constant learning. It's not like we can check a box and we're done. I always have to think about you know, what I do to a space if I'm going to an event where students of color are. Um, you know, My perspective as a white woman, um, making sure that I'm thinking about this all the time. Um, and there's a few strategies that I have. I have cards that identify all different identities that I keep on my desk to make sure that I'm thinking about the, all of these things in decisions that I make, in meetings I'm holding, who I'm inviting to the table to make sure we have so many different perspectives that we're making the best decision for um, really the most, um, probably negatively impacted student on our campus. And that can be around race, financials, um, all those things have to be considered. Um, I wanna just sort of give you some strategies and then action items um, as well. So a lot of times we talk about microaggressions and recently we started talking about microaffirmations. What are the kind of things that we can do to actually hold people up and show that we care. And one of the things I'm trying really hard on my campus is to create an environment where people know we care about them, right? So that they're willing to come in. And some of that is asking opinions, recognizing the achievement of people who identify differently than we do. You know, Paula talked about being friendly and, you know, making a warm gesture to someone who you just meet because you're waiting in line at um, the grocery store, right? 
um, really taking an interest in someone. Um, there's lots of links and you know, I don't wanna spend too much time, but I want you to take some time where you, you can Google this and look at what these affirmations are and think about how you can build this through your own practices. Um, because I think it, um, it does, for me as a white woman who's been doing work around equity and inclusion for a very long time, I want people to see the actions that I take so that they see me doing the, the hard work and actually making a difference um, by my actions, not by me saying I'm an ally, right? Like that's, that's not what this is about. We have to be taking action and showing people that we understand and that we're continuing to learn to do the best that we, we can to impact change. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this um, this idea of equity, right? Because we, we, we talk about equity, but really understanding and trying to notice when things are inequitable. And some of the images you can see where someone's shoveling the steps before shoveling a ramp, right? When we can all go up the ramp, right? The inequity that's there for the person who is um, in the wheelchair. But the thing that I wanna move us to is this idea of equity-mindedness. And for me on my campus, one of the things that we did that I think really spoke to equity mindedness was creating an English language learner policy where students who English is not their heritage language get extra time on exams. And it has changed how students are succeeding. And we have our first nursing students who pass their boards who took care of this process. And how we can use this sort of in our everyday lives or the work that you do, um, if it's outside of education, is this idea of recognizing that everyone doesn't need the same thing, right? If we have an, some, a neighbor move in who um, identifies as a black woman, what might they need to know to feel safe in our community? What could you do as a neighbor to make sure that you're providing what would be equity mindedness to make sure that they felt like we wanted them as neighbors, that we wanted them to feel comfortable in our community. So kind of using it in that model. And quite frankly, in the education system, the, the um, accommodations that we make around accessibility really show us a way to look at this idea of equity mindedness. So now action items for you to consider. Actually starting tonight, um, USF is doing a business uh, certificate diversity ed program. I can't remember how many weeks it is, but there's lots of opportunities online to do education at this point. This can't be, we did the library series and now we're done, right? There's all these um, opportunities to get engage in learning and to continue that process. On social media, it's really, I highly recommend following people who identify in a variety of ways. A lot of times I see a post, I follow, I go and see who posted it and I start following them to get insight on um, different perspectives. There's people who are talking a lot about race and disability and race and sexuality and you know so many different identities that we need to be, um, use that platform to kind of educate yourself. Talk to your family members about it. Lean into those hard conversation. Be critical of um, yourself. Who are your friends? You know, right now we're not really inviting people to dinner, but who do you have over to your house um, under normal, you know, sort of regular sort of circumstances? Bear witness. If we see something, we should um, talk about it. We should address it. Um, donate if you can. Uh, buy from black owned businesses. There are resources online that um, right now there's actually a Facebook group for black owned businesses in um, the 607 area code that you can see what people are doing for businesses and take it advantage and support those businesses. Join the NAACP. Um, voting, um, you know, League of Women Voters, we, you know, we really need to be voting in small and large elections. Judges and dis 
district attorneys can make huge differences in the outcomes that people face. Um, NPR has a, a whole list of books and films and podcasts um, to, for you to continue learning. Um, I you know, highly recommend you go to that site. MTV and um, the Anti-Defamation League that a number of years ago put together a project that a good friend and colleague of mine worked on called Look Different. There are, um, you can sign up for, they call them bias cleanses, where you get an email every day to get you to rethink um, things that are just ingrained in us based on, um, you know, schooling, um, religious affiliations, media, you know, all those things that we're just bombarded with. This, there's all these resources on those pages to support um, learning. So I, I just realized one of my slides didn't show. I just saw something today on social media that I wanted to talk, talk about quickly. And it's this idea of um, considering our interactions. So when people became outraged about George Floyd, as a white person, expressing my outrage to people of color could feel like I was so new to this that I wasn't recognizing that there's this history that this is ongoing. This summer when I did a presentation, I pulled out a shirt that I had bought I don't know, 10 years ago that reflected this idea around Black Lives Matter, right? And trying to remind people that this is not new. This continues and social media has really given us more insight to it, but there are people who have been doing this work and really being anti-racist for a very long time. So when we're outraged, we have to really be careful because we should process this on our own. It really shows our privilege uh, that we're saying we're new to this, right? That we have to be cognizant of that and make sure that we're processing that with other white people and on our own and focus on self-educating. Performance, we also wanna be really careful about performing around our anti-racism. If you are someone who likes to post on social media, for every post or hashtag that you share, do something quietly that is an action. If it's donating money or something else, but do something that you're not performing. You're doing it because it's deep in who you are. Um, guilt. A lot of white people have guilt and get stuck in the guilt. We don't wanna be stuck in the guilt. We wanna work through that. We want to, you know, whatever it means. Do you meditate? Do you journal? How are you gonna process through the work that needs to happen to get us to be truly anti-racist? And it's continuous. It's not gonna just be this stop point and you can be like, okay, I'm good to go. It's a continuous process. Um, don't shame others. Not everyone is in the same spot and it's important that we're bringing people along and not shaming them to where they don't continue the process because we want to stand up for racism, have conversations with people so that they understand and can join us in this process. Um, shaming, uh, you know, it doesn't feel good for any of us, quite frankly. So making sure that we're addressing it in a way that actually keeps people engaged and wanting to know more debating. I can't stand, you know, I debate, but I, it's not the way for us to have learning. We really need to calmly explain our perspective. If someone wants to engage more with an open mind, then please move forward, but think about it as a dialogue. And how do we engage in dialogues where people's perspectives are heard and learning happens. So if I'm telling you my experience, you're not telling me this is not, well, like that can't be true. We don't wanna undermine or explain away someone's experience that they're telling you. We wanna learn and grow from it. And sometimes it means having to sit in what we've said and what we've done, even though it wasn't our intent, it wasn't what we wanted to happen, but it's how learning and growing can happen. I have some, and that's um, at holiday, Phillips, who posted that those tips, and there's a lot more information in what they put on social media. 
Um, there's some great books as parents. If you're a parent, please talk to your kids about racism. We have this false sense that we can't do it when they're little, like it's not appropriate, but you can. There's some good new books out, a kid's book about systemic racism by Jordan Theory and a kid's book about privilege by Ben Sand. Um, I also just purchased, I haven't started reading it yet, but Parent Like It Matters by Janice Johnson DS. PhD. So her daughter is Marley Diaz, who started um, an organization where she collects books that have um, the characters all have diverse identities um, and has been, I mean, she just had an interview on social media with um, Michelle Obama. So she's doing, and she's like 16. Um, so she's doing amazing, amazing work. So I'm guessing her mom has some good advice about parenting. This last um, visual is really just to get you to think about where am I in this process? So, um, you know, you can take some time with this when it's on YouTube, but it's this idea of that there is a process and how do we learn and grow and lean into the discomfort? And this, I just love this quote. So another world, of course I can't, oh, I missed it. Another world is not only possible, she is, on, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Arundhati Roy. Thank you, everyone. Um, Joanne, was there a question, I think, specifically for, or did we catch that? Was yes, there, a question there, was on... a, there was a question for Mary. Um, someone was looking for the Facebook page that you had mentioned about black owned businesses in the area. I think you are you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, I'll, look, I'll send a link in the chat. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mary and um, Michelle, would you like to uh, Take, the, take us on to the next part of the journey, please. Sure, I don't have a presentation. I'm just here as a, as a voice and uh, maybe to offer some suggestions. Um, thank you, Mary, for that presentation and everybody before me. And I'm just honored to be here. Oh my gosh, it made me big. <laughs> so um, having lived in the Oneana area, um, gosh, since 1985, since I was 10 years old, um, my experiences have varied. But what, what I, I think I really wanna to speak to is making people feel welcome. And one of the things that makes me feel welcome as a person of color, and I know I've been here for a while, so you'd think that I'd feel absolutely comfortable in my own skin all the time. And that's not true. So when you live in upstate rural New York, very oftentimes there are not a lot of people that look like you. Um, fortunately, because of my position in education and working with, um, collaborations with the college and being a city council member, I have been very fortunate to cross paths with many people who've come and gone at SUNY Oneonta. Um, one of them was mentioned in my bio, Dr. Eddie Alvarez, one of my best friends. Um, and he has come and gone, and I, I, I think I can share this with you, um, partially because he didn't feel entirely comfortable in this community. And um, so I, I speak a little bit of Oneonta, but Cooperstown's in my heart because not everybody knows that my husband's from Cooperstown and we have property in Fly Creek. So we spend a lot of time in Fly Creek. I love Cooperstown, I love Oneonta, I love this upstate um, New York area. But as a person of color, it's very hard to live here because A, not a lot of people look like you, okay? That's the number one thing. Um, and when you're young and you're growing up here, so I'm pushing 50, so I've been here for quite some time. Um, and two, there aren't a lot of opportunities uh, for you to meet other people of color, unless you are involved in higher education in some way, shape, or form, or maybe some of the larger organizations that hire or happen to hire people of color. And I think that as a community, you can be very purposeful in how you acclimate new people to the community, as simple as having, like, I love that there's an online resource, but something more personable is really, is really nice. So I know a few, couple of years ago, a uh, couple of years in a row, we did a meet and greet uh, as the NAACP. 
And I met actually a former principal of Cooperstown who has become a wonderful friend of mine and we still keep in touch. I just talked to her yesterday, Donna Lucy. She was in Cooperstown for a short time and uh, remains a very close friend of mine. And I, I would not have met her nor she have met me and we provided a lot of support to each other because of that meet and greet. So it's a lot easier if you facilitate those types of things for new people as they come into the community. And I believe Hartwood College not that long ago had a meet and greet, I was involved in that as well to introduce some of the new staff members at Hartwood College in Oneonta. So I think if there is one thing you could do that I have found helpful as, as, as a person who lives in this community, who's always seeking, and I have lots of friends in the community who don't look like me, but I'm always looking for opportunities to connect with other people of color. And so those things have been really helpful for me as I venture out and meet new people. And I know it was helpful to them as well. And then I think being purposeful about not just hosting meet and greets, but other maybe types of mixers often so that people can get together. And I can't reiterate it enough, the NAACP, that's my love, but you must know this, if you're joining the NAACP, the Oneonta area NAACP, if you are a white person, you are not the minority. Okay, that's just the way that it is because we're in upstate New York, but it is where I find my my niche and my love of being able to help the community and help people feel welcome and help those marginalized individuals, not just people of color, but people from a, a, a social economic status that is lower. So I just can't impress upon you enough to be mindful in those things. And it makes my heart so happy that you're having this series. This is important work that needs to continue before I became a council member in Oneonta, uh, I was a part of the Oneonta's Inclusivity Summit. And that was an initiative started by the former mayor, Dick Miller, who uh, was very involved and in, in his heart really believed in that. He's no longer with us. Um, he has a tragic story, but he believed in creating a more diverse Oneonta. And he got me started on that. And that is why I became interested in politics and running for city council because I wanted to be more involved in my community and meet more people and just sort of know how the community works and runs. So this, this initiative that you guys have started has really, I think, opened up the door to people realizing what they can do and how they can help people of color feel more welcome in the community. So that along with, I think, honestly, I'm gonna blame a lot of it on COVID and George Floyd. Those two things happened at the same time. And I think people were feeling some type of way. They either, they wanted to get involved and people, I don't, I don't know how else to, 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 to put it, but really came out of the woodwork in support of their um, brothers and sisters of color uh, last summer. And we saw that, we saw that with, with all of the protests, uh, the vigils, everything that happened. And I'm gonna tell you, anybody who was involved, and I know a lot of people on this panel were involved in those, you didn't see me there. I wasn't at any of the protests for Black Lives Matter. And part of that is, Mary had already mentioned, um, your local chapter of the NAACP has been doing a lot of work with that. And to be honest with you, I was tired. I, I just really couldn't do it anymore. I was not in the headspace. And I had a, um, an act of racism against me last summer that shook me to my core. And it was simply someone calling me a name, but it hadn't happened to me in a long time. And I just couldn't bring myself to be involved or be around any hateful vitriol, which, which did occur at some of the, the rallies. And so it was just too emotionally difficult for me. So I, I applaud you for recognizing that, um, that the work has been ongoing. And I, I just have to say this because I, I haven't heard it said, Black Lives Matter, you know, there's a lot of debate about Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter please don't get it twisted, is a civil rights movement. It's a civil rights movement. It's not about anybody's lives not being, anybody other than a black person not being valued, but we're in the midst of a civil rights movement that started a long time ago. So, and we're still working through that. So I had to say that because I don't hear a lot of people saying that or, or really just putting it in that lens. Um, I think that we need to really look at that for what it is. It's a civil rights movement. So it's, it's liberating for me, a person of color, to see all of you so involved, some of you of color, some of you not. Um, and a lot of my 
white brothers and sisters just being involved. So I'll share this little snippet with you. Lo your local chapter of the NAACP, which does include, it's the Oneana area. So that does include Cooperstown. We have a lot of Cooperstown members, by the way. 50 to 75 members before George Floyd. We are two, about 250 members strong. That's amazing. And people are showing up to the meetings and they're doing the work and they're asking what they can do. If you show up, we'll put you on a committee. Um, we'd love to have you. It's all of us working together to make a greater change for our area. So I think that's probably the number one thing you could do. Um, and also, seriously, NAACP and creating experiences for people to mingle and to meet and to just get to know each other. And panels like this and having difficult conversations. I just wrote an article in the paper about how we, we, we lack civil discourse, right? We're not able to have conversations without somebody getting bent out of shape. And I think it's really important for us to realize that people who think differently than us, we have to meet them where they are, right? Meet them where they are, but we also have to listen with an open heart and an open mind. I live here by choice. I've had several opportunities to leave. My husband has, has a, a wanderlust spirit and would love to move someplace bigger where there's more to do. And um, I insist on staying here for the, for the very reason that my friends and colleagues who have come and gone left because I feel that my work is best served in a community like this where there are not a lot of people who look like me in positions that I have. Whether it's a, an educational administrator, you're not gonna see a lot of black principals in upstate New York, right? Um, or black teachers for that matter. So I feel like my work is important staying here so that young people, not just people of color, but the majority of people, white children and other white people see a person of color in a position that I have. So that's what's important to me. And you know, hopefully through engaging with people as they come to our community, making them feel welcome through these various means, getting them in touch with people like me, because I'm looking for those people as well, right? They're looking to feel welcome and I'm looking for other people that look like me um, to connect with. So I also can't impress upon you enough. Mary mentioned social media. And I know that we have a bad taste in our mouth when, we, when I say the word Twitter, okay? But I want you to rethink that because the only reason why I know about the Black Principles Network is because of Twitter. The only reason why I have connected with educators across the country and attended meaningful professional development is because of Twitter. So I just wanna put that out there um, to impress upon you that there are so many ways to connect with people. And I love those ways to connect with people, but I wanna connect with real live people here. So once this pandemic uh, loosens up, doubly vaccinated by the way, so I'm feeling kind of invincible right now. Uh, once we open up and we can mingle and meet with people, um, feel free to include me because I'd love to be a part of that. That's what keeps me going and keeps me wanting to be in this community and branch out and connect with people and share my story and I wanna hear their stories. So I don't wanna to talk too much. I know that other people have to speak and there might be a question and answer along the way, but I welcome questions um, and I share my experiences. Uh, and my vulnerability with you. So just so you know, there is no question too difficult to ask of me. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I believe there is a question, but do, uh, Joanne, do you wanna say that for later or ask it now, what's your preference? I think we could throw it out there now. Um, so uh, the question is, can, can you explain why it is important to support black owned businesses? Um, and we don't really know a lot of history about or the importance of this movement. So if someone could speak to that, thank you. Well, so I, I can tell you in our community, black owned businesses are small businesses. So it's important to support all small businesses because right now, um, first of all, they're struggling because of COVID, but they were struggling before. So I can speak to only on to the demise of downtown and the lack of people frequenting businesses. And I can't even blame it on the mall because if you've been to the mall, it's nearly empty. So supporting a black owned business or a small business, but particularly a black owned business because they're usually not well known, they're usually smaller businesses, um, 
is important because they're, they make up the fabric of our community. And without them, we don't have much of anything. So if anybody else could speak to this, I just think it's important that we support small businesses in our community. And in our in Oneonta, I can speak. I don't know if there's a lot of black owned businesses in the Cooperstown area, but most of them are mom and pop shops. So you're talking about supporting your neighbor, supporting your friends, supporting your colleagues um, in the community. And I know that I live center city downtown. I live center city that we bought our house on purpose so that I could walk to main street. So my kids could walk to center street school, which subsequently closed after we bought our house, the school uh, closed down. So, but that school remains near and dear to my heart because that's where I started out. But um, supporting those businesses supports your community and supports the things that you desire to have in your community. I'll tell you this, um, I myself am guilty of not support. I live walking distance to Main Street and I don't go main, I don't go downtown. I don't shop a lot, but the businesses that have gone, I miss them. Just the convenience of them being there. And now that they're not there, I miss them. So anybody else want to add to that? Um, I would just add the, um, the idea of closing the wealth gap, right? Like that, you know, it's this idea of, um, you know, it's easy to buy a book on Amazon, right? Like, but shouldn't we be looking at um, small businesses like Michelle's talking about? And also then there's lots of, there are a lot of black owned, you know, bookstores and there's just, and social media is a great way to connect to that. Um, I did add an article in um, the chat that sort of gives six reasons why. Um, from this one article perspective, but I think closing the wealth gap is probably my number one reason okay. for trying to support black owned businesses. Great. Um, uh, could, okay, well, why don't could I just, there's one there, other question yeah, that I think maybe Michelle could speak to. Um, I love this question. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about uh, Cassandra Asa Miller and then I, uh, Cassandra asked a question? Is that what the one? Yes. So I just read an article about this and um, they likened uh, the, these groups, these majority of white groups hosting all of these diversity panels and discussions. And, um, and I read somewhere that it's um, white supremacy with a hug. And I thought that was interesting. I don't know where I read that. Did you read that as well, Mary? So, and what that means is it's, I think it's it's to make people feel better about themselves, right? But when you're hosting a diversity session and and it's 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 a largely white group, and I'm just trying to speak from the heart. I'm just being honest. Um, I'm not going to say that it doesn't seem feel sincere, but it's certainly not going to feel welcoming. And you know, who's your target audience? Is your target audience people of color? Is your target audience white people? But I'm thinking the experts on this are probably people who look like the people you're trying to include, right? So, um, and I'm not saying that there aren't people who are not of color doing great work, they are, but you really have to purposefully find people from all walks of life, all backgrounds to be present in those conversations. So, you know, I, I think that's the best way that I can answer that. Um, you know, and then what happens with with your diversity programming if you don't have a person of color involved? Where does it go? You have a wonderful program, you think it's great, it's well received, what now, right? I think that's that's the big question, what now? Because if there aren't people of color involved, then you can check that off your list, you did the training and you move on. Uh, okay. Uh, anything else, Joanne, or should we go on to our next speaker? Oh, you're muted. I think it's. I think we're good to go on. All right. Um, why don't we have uh, Carrie? Uh, Carrie Fuertes, you want to um, take it away? Hi. Hi, everyone. Well, basically, I'm kind of recapping a little bit of what's being said because the question becomes is where do we go from here? What do we want to achieve? And as Michelle mentioned at the end there, and I'm paraphrasing her, we started this wonderful series, but are the efforts gonna stall after the series is over? 
I believe we all want a community that even if not diverse in population, um, we, want, we want diversity and that is really important for all of us in this conversation. We have heard from various panelists in education, in healthcare, law enforcement, tourism, and the arts on the structural racism of their particular institution and how a given institution has tried to implement diversity and change. Some have done this better than others. So how can we as a community help in the process? How can we hold these institutions, which are the cultural and economic uh, backbone of our community accountable? How do we go from participation in a didactic forum about racism to action against race racism? We know from the number of registered participants and from the number of YouTube views that many in our community, like those of us involved in this series, are learning about the concepts like institutional, institutional and systemic racism, which can extend to the individual as a form of unintentional racism. Uh, what can the individual do? Basically, we can take action. For starters, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we have created a survey that registered participants can access. There is a question asking if you, the participant, would be interested in getting involved in developing a more anti-racist community. When you see the question, I urge you to commit yourself to finding the best way for you to take action to build an anti-racist community. We can only achieve these anti-racist goals by working together. We can have a core group of interested constituents be part of a committee that works with representatives of a given institution to ensure that diverse and anti-racist policies are being implemented. We can demand our institution to do better by serving as a community conscience. Um, we can, as we have heard, there are many resources available at the local and state level. We should proactively utilize them. For example, uh, we can support and provide aid to our schools in order to chip away at the unintentional or internalized racism that can develop in a homogenous population such as Cooperstown. Uh, we can do this by training and supporting educators to lead discussions on race and otherness with students using age appropriate language and material. As mentioned previously, it's never too early to start. Um, we can support the PTA as they would, they, they would and can take the lead in educating the parents of their own internalized racism. Um, similarly, this core committee can help support programs with law enforcement that provide anti-racist workshops to officers who work hard at protecting us, but have been thought to be unwelcoming by some to visitors of color. And we need to encourage families of color to vacation in our area. We need to change the perception that folks of color are not a welcome demographic. We have a rich and diverse community presently in Cooperstown in our doctors in training, yet there appears to be a little bonding between the individual and a community, which is a shame because inter that interaction will enrich us all. And I think that part of that, I was mentioned, there's this divide where the community doesn't seem accessible to some of these young doctors. Um, we as a community need to want to become anti-racist and be willing to work for it for the health of our village and its residents. So please keep an eye out in your, uh, for the survey uh, that you will receive and you have access to uh, for the information how you can participate in this endeavors. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, I think there was just to let me mention there, someone asked, um, is the recording going to be available afterwards? And yes, it will be available afterwards um, through, uh, if you go to the Friends of Village Libraries 
um, webpage, um, there'll be a link to the YouTube um, uh, recording for that. Um, it, it usually takes a couple of days to get it to make it happen, but it will be. So, um, Leanne, let's I just see. Would like to add, I'm yes. Um, so we, we have a lot of great resources that are coming up from our chat with panelists. Is there a way to put that on the library website so that people can can see all of that? I believe so. I believe that is the plan is to put that all up there. Um, I, I maybe Lynn, you can uh, confirm that for me. Uh, someone will have to show me how to capture all of that from the chat, but we would love to put all of those resources up on our page. Okay, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> and the, this is an excellent segue for uh, Lynn, if you can um, uh, take over and, and um, tell us your thoughts, please. I'll be brief. I think everybody um, tonight has really touched on a lot of the things that I wanted to. Um, we started this series feeling that the community couldn't just look at law enforcement, that um, if we were going to tackle issues of racism, we needed to take a really broad look at our community. Because if you look only at police violence, you're missing, I think, everything that comes before that point. That police officers are enforcing the law. Who's making the laws? What are the laws? What are the policies at all the different institutions that impact our lives? Those are the things that we wanted to look at. And I'm so grateful to the leaders of all the institutions in our community who have taken part in, in this series. We've had really great participation. Um, one of the things that struck me as really interesting um, was how the when we had the general manager of the Otisaga talking with the head of the National Baseball Hall of Fame on one of our panels, they were bringing up the same issues that they were dealing with in their institutions, the same concerns about being welcoming and making sure that their staffs were prepared to talk with, um, with visitors from all throughout the world. Similar issues were coming up from the hospital leadership. Um, when they were talking about both their staff and their patients. And um, maybe Michelle, when I'm done, you could talk a little bit more about that Oneana Inclusion Summit um, that you spoke of earlier, because possibly that's something that we need in Cooperstown is more opportunities for the leaders of all of our institutions to share ideas on what's, what is being successful. Um, the feedback that I've gotten from individuals in our community, I think we do have a lot of people that, um, that wanna continue this work. Those of us who've been on the planning committee do pl uh, plan to gather the results of that survey and, and to see if we can carry this work forward. Um, I think there are individual actions and many of us have, have reiterated some of those tonight and there are collective actions. And I'm a big one for not recreating the wheel. I'm one of those people, Michelle, that jumped on the board and joined the NAACP and am excited to see what um, work can be accomplished together through that um, organization. Um, and I just want to also reiterate that um, I, I agree with everything that's been said about not shaming the people that we are coming into contact with and trying to work with and trying to improve understanding and find ways to work together. Um, the, the lack of civil discourse is something that really bothers me. Uh, Leanne and I were involved in an effort with an organization called the Braver Angels that was trying to promote conversations between um, you know, different people with pol different political views to try to build a way for communities to have more constructive conversations. So I think all of that work is important. And I think all of us need to push forward individually and collectively. But I do encourage you to, um, you know, you'll be getting an email from the Friends of the Village Library with that survey. Um, please uh, fill it out and be part of uh, the group going forward. Um, we, we need people to work together. Um, this is an example of something else that's just come up in the last day or two. I was contacted. Um, uh, by a, a 14 year old girl in our community, an Asian American who um, is feeling really hurt by the Asian American violence and hate that she's been feeling um, this past year. And um, uh, there's a movement afoot to try to start a, some sort of a public gathering, a rally perhaps sometime in April um, to sh show support for that community as well. So I, I think we have so many good people um, in our community, people who wanna be involved in this work, people who wanna carry it forward. And so I, you know, I really just want to thank everybody that got on board and, and joined in this effort and, and hope that you'll keep working with us. And um, particularly to thank Leanne for moderating all of our sessions and taking our, our program um, to put a whole lot of time in, in, into it. And we really appreciate that. 
So um, since Mary ended with a quote, I'm just going to throw out my favorite Martin Luther King quote. Um, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So as as uncomfortable as it sometimes make me, it makes me um, trying not to be silent. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Lynn. And I think that I, before we start with the Q&A, uh, um, Joanne, I'll go ahead and share my screen that has um, the link to the survey. So you can all see that. Just We'll just take a brief moment to do that. Um, so you can actually um, put your phone up to the screen <laughs> to that um, and and uh, take a picture of that scan um, of that QR code, and you'll be able to go there. Um, but there's also the link on the bottom too, uh, and, and I'll show that again as well. But but uh, and and we have the emails. We have collected the emails from people who have registered for for these sessions, and we'll be sending the survey out to people as well. So I'm hoping that that will give you plenty of opportunity to to uh, get your. Um, to, to fill out the survey. Joanne, um, did you have, I can leave this on for a little bit longer before I stop my share, but in the meantime, are there some questions um, that people had that we can answer? Um, just people really wanting to um, have access to the list of all of these great resources out there. And um, so hopefully we can just, I've been copying and pasting in my own personal messages so that I, I have that myself and I can share it with Lynn to get up on the library website. Thank you for doing that, Joanne. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, hold on one sec. Uh, well, while we're waiting for questions from the audience, could, um, could we have Michelle talk a little bit more about that inclusivity summit that was held with the, the former mayor in Oneana? I, I can I can share with you what I remember. So it was 2015. It was quite some time ago, and it, we had a series of roundtable discussions, different topics, and I think the question was what we wanted Oneonta to look like. Like that was sort of the the basic premise of the whole thing is what we wanted to Oneonta to look like, and we envisioned spaces, we envisioned um, a welcome center, we envisioned um, purposeful activities, like I talked about, like the meet and greet. I can't. You know, so what happened was is Mayor Miller passed away. So we started that work and it never, it, it just never, it just sort of fizzled out. And, you know, I'm, I'm sad to say that I was a part of it and I wasn't a part of moving it forward. But to be honest, we were devastated at the loss of, of Mayor Miller. He took his own life. And um, so we, we were gonna cancel the summit, but we thought the work was too important to not, to, to not do it. But then it never really, um, went beyond that. But it was really simply different panelists talking about different aspects of our community that we wanted to build stronger. So whether it was businesses, whether it was the parks, whether it was community events, we talked about having cultural events. Um, like there's, a, I think Oneana typically has an Italian festival, but we talked about having other types of festivals and we have actually had a Caribbean festival uh, a couple summers in a row. So just different ways to make people in the community feel more welcome. And one of the things that I, I will tell you that I remember that was really meaningful was that um, we, so when you have events like that, automatically you are excluding people who can't get to the events. And I remember Joanne Fisher, who is the secretary of the NAACP and wife of Lee Fisher, the president, she said, we're, we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna have to go. We're gonna have to go. And I, I remember we went to, at the time it was Lantern Hill. It, at Lantern Hill, it was uh, called something else, but the trailer park by Walmart over in Oneonta. Um, we went by foot and we knocked door to door. We went to the mayor led us apartments. We offered, we had bus runs. We had SUNY Oneonta runs. Like we brought people in the community who are part of our community who couldn't be there. So it, it was a lot of work, a lot of heavy lifting um, beforehand to bring that event. And because we had done all that work was another reason why, and to honor uh, Dick Miller, to sort of bring people together. And it was a really joyous event and it was widely attended. We had many guest speakers. We had um, a Reverend Vaughn who, who's from like uh, Rochester area come and speak and his wife came to speak. Um, and Joe Yelich, the superintendent of the Oneana City School District had that connection because he was from sort of the up north 
and he was able to get community speakers in. I see that this panel, uh, one of the things that you guys did was you had an educational panel and you had Dr. Lavelle Brown speak, uh, a, a friend of mine, and he's amazing. I did share in the chat the diversity playbook, which I believe Cooperstown has. I don't know if they've signed it or um, uh, dedicated themselves to that work of that diversity playbook, but I shared it because although it's geared towards schools, it's ways to make your community, your school community, but I would, I would dare say that it's a way to make any business organization or community more diverse. And it just, it's really a commitment to diversity. So the summit, if you could do some type of summit, it, you're gonna, it, you know, it takes a lot of people involved and you wanna have a lot of different panels, kind of like you did leading up to this. You could carry that on to the community once we open up um, and you know we had it at Foothill. So it was a big meeting event center that we had the Otis, you guys have the Otis Saga, right? So what a great opportunity to get people in and to have different discussion groups and different panels live, you know, in person to just sort of talk about those things. We had surveys, um, we had difficult discussions, we had breakout groups, and then we all came together and shared out what our vision was. And I'm not sure what happened to that because some of the people who were involved with that, Susan Terrell, who worked at SUNY Oneana, was a key player. She was, um, I think she became the Dean. She was, she worked at the college, but then she left. So a lot of those people have since gone. So that's also a big part of, you know, why we didn't continue with that. But um, I would ask you if you have not already seen the, uh, the diversity playbook that I put in the chat to look at that. And I think that's a great basis or ba great foundation for starting that work in any organization or any community, your, com your commitment with your level, with your, with a level of commitment towards diversity. It's small steps that can really help you. And it, it talks about recruiting. It talks about uh, getting people to come in. And I think you could use that as well. He probably, I'm guessing he probably shared that with you when he did the educate, when he came in and spoke to the education panel. He was a wonderful speaker. Yeah. yeah. And the whole idea of, um, you know, you don't want to just bring in a speaker to talk about diversity. You need to look at all of the policies, um, you know, throughout your organization uh, to see that you're implementing policies that support the goals that you have for equity. Mm -hmm. I mean, Leanne, could, could we just go back to the uh, black businesses um, for a minute? Unless, are there okay. any other, there is just, uh, I don't want to interrupt the questions, but um, on that question of the black businesses, and you know, this is something I have found that the, the total erasure of history, you know, I mean, black businesses were thriving in this country separately, but thriving. I mean, Tulsa, this incredible, the Wall Street of, 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 of the Southwest crushed through a racist attack. Central Park, there was a, a community of black business in Central Park, wiped out to make Central Park the thing we love so much. Frederick uh, Law Olmsted didn't care about that. So, so uh, Asian Americans, something I just read, you may have heard this very famous Asian American photographer who just recently died and he made his mission to uh, recreate photographs where of historical moments when Africa, where Asian Americans were not depicted when they had been there, where they'd been literally erased. And specifically, and most, most uh, well known, the one where the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, the two, two tracks met, and there was a huge photograph of all the workers, big celebration. Hundreds of Asian Americans worked on that and died, and they were, they were not put in the picture. They were excluded from the picture that most people see in their history books. So when we think about supporting black businesses, it's, it's also part of a payback. It's also part of a reparations. It's also part of a recognition that we missed whole swaths of our history. And that's why there are not so many black businesses around because we erased the momentum that had been built. And, um, you know, to find things, friend again, you know, gave me an article of a, of, a, of a black owned business in Oneonta that had gotten coverage. I went specifically there to use the business and had a great, great experience. I wouldn't have known about it if it hadn't been publicized. So it's a combination of keeping our minds open, but also sharing constantly things that we know. But I just wanted to remind us all about the history of black business. It's not always, it is true about closing the wealth gap, but there was a lot of black wealth that white society erased. 
and couldn't stand and couldn't stand the sight of and destroyed. And that that is part of what we really need to be dealing with, I think, is recognizing that and trying to somehow uh, uh, make good. Just want to get that in. Uh, we have another question. Um, I'll put it out to the panel. What do you think are some of the most effective anti-racist anti -racist efforts happening in the community currently in any of the areas that this series has covered? Um, I, I was very impressed with what Francesca Zambello spoke about with regard to the Glimmergast Festival where she put concrete hiring um, practices into place. Um, I think she shared with us that her goal was one third um, of her staff and performers uh, that she had set as a goal for inclusion that she wanted to have as people of color. And you know, I, th that impressed me as something very concrete. If you're a leader of an institution and you could say, this is a measurable goal that I'm putting into place, I thought that was a really you know, great example of it. Um, and again, what, what Dr. Brown was talking about, what he was trying to implement in the Ithaca schools, I, I thought were very concrete steps as well. Have to say something about the village of Cooperstown and the um, the policing reform. You know, we have a very small police force, and it would be, have been tempting to kind of not consider it a serious topic. But the village really put a lot of time into responding to the governor's call, and um, you know, I think something is coming from that that will be something to be proud of and show visitors that this is what our police force, as small as it is is supposed to, uh, these are the guidelines, these are the values, this is what we want to see take done and what we never want to see done. Uh, I don't see any other questions right now. So if we want to move on. Well, does anyone, anyone have any questions or, or for each other actually, um, or discussion or comments that you want to make? Uh, uh, this is such a, an amazing panel. Um, and uh, I always say you may not have a chance to, to be together like this. Uh, it'd be, uh, hopefully you will, but but to have an opportunity to ask each other questions, I think would be great. So um, I know Lynn, you've asked um, one already, but does anybody else have other questions that they have? I have another question for Mary, if nobody else has one. <laughs> um, Mary, I, I, we had spoke briefly about, um, I guess you could call it bystander training. You know, like it, I, I, we want to, not shame people, but we also want to have the language um, to confront racism when we hear it being expressed, you know, near us, around us. And I wonder if you have resources or thoughts on, you know, safe and effective ways to respond to racism, uh, racist situations that we encounter. So one of the things that we uh, we've been working on and some of the education sort of pieces um, is building an intergroup dialogue program. Um, and although that takes time and, you know, really people sitting with each other and listening and um, having conversation, I think that's a really powerful way for people to develop deep understanding and develop the skills to sit in the discomfort and to listen. Um, I there are definitely ways, you know, we would do, um, when I was at Oneana, we would do an orientation program where we would give um, students ways to respond, right? Like you could respond with being direct, you could respond with making, you know, trying to twist what, you know, change what someone's saying, like flipping it on its head a bit um, with humor. Um, it's really sometimes just asking the question you know, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that, right? And getting the person to process a little bit on their own. Um, sometimes you just have to walk away depending, you know, on the situation and how intense it is. Um, you know, educating yourself gives you the tools to be able to speak to it. 
um, when I went back to school to do my dissertation, um, I found it really helpful to have researchers that I could pull out. You know, I was saying the same exact thing I had said for, you know, over 20 years, but when I could say, you know, well, according to the research, it just changed how I was being heard. So I think, um, you know, having a toolbox of your own, what you're most comfortable with, if it's asking questions, if it's, um, you know, kind of changing it, um, the distraction, you know, there's all different tools that you can do, but um, educating yourself so you have the confidence to sort of lean into that discomfort and really just say, sometimes it's, you know, I really don't like what you just said. Um, and this is why, this is how this is making me feel. Um, I'm trying to understand why you, you know, why you said that. Um, to help the person process, like sometimes people do say things um, and it is that, it, you know, it's not the intent, right? But they have to recognize that there's trauma, right? Like what they've said could really have caused trauma and been hurtful. So how do we um, address that? Uh, we, use, we used to do this ouch and oops, like, so you say something and it's hurtful. So you say, ouch. And we actually had this like culture on campus where students really were using that. Um, and then, you know, you say something and you say, oops. So people recognize, wait, what just came out of my mouth was not what I meant. Um, but it's important. I think the self-education and really coming up with in moments that you might anticipate being prepared to respond. And sometimes, you know, you can't prepare um, and you're taken off guard, but you can revisit it, right? Like even if you walk away from a situation, and I tell faculty this all the time, if something happens in your classroom that you at the moment didn't know what to do, you can still go back the next day and say, you know what, yesterday this happened and we need to talk about it. And even you can do that with family and friends. Um, to sort of come back better prepared in the conversation. And students, particularly in a classroom, wanna know that you heard it and you're doing something. Even if you don't know what you're doing, that you're actually recognizing that whatever happened, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I don't have all the answers, but I think we need to talk about this. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Joanne, I think there is there one more comment there you want to make and then uh, or does anybody else have any questions for other people we're, we're coming in on uh, just a couple more minutes, I think, before we're done. I just shared the yeah. link for the um, just the Daily Star article on the inclusivity summit. I didn't realize it was 2014. It was quite a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we just have a comment um, that these are all such awesome women. And thank you all to all of the panelists for leading by such great example and speaking up on these topics that need to be discussed in our community. Absolutely. Paula, did you have something? Uh, you're muted. You only have one minute and you spend part of it being muted. It's not so smart. I wanted to ask uh, Carrie something about, about um, you know, I notice very specifically, especially in the mammography department, there's there's a tremendous effort to make you feel comfortable when you go in there. And I was just curious about parallels, you know, in terms of training, uh, putting patients at ease in a somewhat delicate situation. You know, do you observe, are there parallels? Are there things that, that, uh, that um, occur that, you know, where race can is sometimes transcended in a situation like that, where people are just made comfortable in general, and that we can, we can extrapolate a little of learning from that? It's, so race and healthcare is a very intricate problem. And the reality is that many women of color are not very comfortable. Um, it's, uh, many times they're even in, and we in, in mammography, in breast imaging, take, make sure, because it is such a delicate situation, 
we make sure that women are very, very comfortable. I have been in situations when I walk in and the, a woman of color sees me and the whole demeanor changes. And right. I'm also then have, are being told about other things that has nothing to do with her breasts, but that's because I'm paying attention. So I think that even though, you know, the atmosphere is really nice, I agree, and it's very wonderful. I think that there is still a lot of problems um, truly listening to women and understanding um, women of color. And I am not just talking about black and brown women, but I see this also with uh, Asian women and, and Southeast Asian population that there is um, a little disconnect between the, the caregivers and, and the patient. Um, and I find this to be a little bit more true in our area as opposed to being in an urban setting where I train, where there's a lot more diversity. So um, I think sometimes staff, to be honest, is not that they're meaning they're, it's not that they are trying not to understand, but it is so foreign sometimes to their experiences. But I'm glad that you do think that it is a very comfortable uh, situation that the mammography uh, unit, because that's what we aim to do. And I do think that we aim to make all women very comfortable. Thank you. But there's a big disconnect. There's a big disconnect between uh, patients of color versus white patients. And there is a big disconnect in terms of care and in terms of being listened to. That is a big problem in medicine that it is surfacing now um, more and more. Carrie, thank, that, you, thank Carrie. you. I, I would like to add to that. Um, as a person of color, having gone through several, so I've gone through several um, <laughs> doctors because they leave. <laughs> uh, the one that I have now, I hope she stays. But um, having had a doctor who was a person of color, they were more in tune to, to conditions that are maybe people of color have. So, and having you know, family members who are people of color with maybe similar conditions. So that's another disconnect that I found um, myself. And as an educator, um, meeting with parents and then them seeing me, and I don't have a lot of parents of color, but I do have some, and they feel particularly isolated, just like a patient of color would in upstate rural New York. So when they see me, right, that I exactly, I experience exactly what you said, that sort of like that ease and there's a comfort and they can ask me about other things or other things that I might know of that may not have anything to do with education, but just because I'm a person of color in the community. So very true. It, it just goes to show that there is this level of low level anxiety and disconnect yes. that is always kind of there and you don't really realize it until you get into a situation where you truly can be comfortable. So that just goes to say that there's a certain level of discomfort, or, you know, free floating discomfort. It's not oriented to any one individual or any one yes. thing, it's just a given situation. Um, you know, I, because of what I do and the position that I'm in, I actually don't get a lot of things thrown at me that I know if I were in a different position or if I did not have, if I was in a physician, it would be a totally different ball game. It's, you know, so that it's, I, I see it, I see it. Um, you know, the difference between somebody who's being solicitous to me. It's the same way, getting a patient who is, you can tell that that patient has absolutely no interaction with a person of color, but because I am the physician and they need me, it's a very 
it becomes a very different situation than if we had met at Price Shopper. Um, yes. So it's just this, it's always very interesting to see how the interactions are in you know, given situations. And so doesn't this speak to a greater need to be intentional about recruiting people of color in our community for jobs, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Great, thank you. Well, it's, it's uh, past 8.30 and I don't wanna hold anybody here any longer. Um, I, I know some people had expectations of, of finishing at 8.30, so I don't wanna keep them longer, but this has been really, really wonderful. Let me just um, share my screen just to make a, a, a few uh, closing remarks. And um, so let's see. So first of all, um, just, oh, I want to thank um, my my co-moderator, Joanne Gardner, and tonight's panelists, uh, Namita, Paula, Mary, Michelle, um, Carrie, and Lynn, for just a terrific session this evening. Um, and and behind the scenes, there's been this uh, dedicated community, a committee that's working both. As you can see, they work both in front of them and behind the scenes. You, uh, uh, Carrie, uh, and then also Nancy Herman. Lynn, Namita, Joanne, uh, Dottie Hudson, Molly Myers, Callie Wright, Emily Gibson, Karen Katz, and Candace Shannon have all been essential. Um, and, and none of this would have been possible without the wholehearted support of the Friends of the Village Library of the Cooperstown Board, as well as the Village Library of Cooperstown. Um, and um, the last thing I want to do is just uh, tell you what steps you can make to make changes happen in this community. So. So what you can do, uh, just I, I, we want to leave you with, say, we'll just say three actions. We don't want to overwhelm you here. So let's just take three actions you can take this week. Um, one is join the join the local NAACP, um, and uh, so just go to their website onianta.naacp.com to learn more about that. Uh, second, I would say is. Why don't you uh, let us know what you think of the series about how you'd like to get involved by filling out the survey. So I think we've, we've sent, uh, I, I think Namita sent it out on the, on the chat, but it's uh, here, here's that um, QR code again and the website. And again, we, we will send you if, you, if you have registered for this, we will send you uh, a link to the survey. Um, and then finally, if, if you have any questions or comments, just go ahead and get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, email us at fovlfriends22main at gmail.com. And uh, that's, that's kind of all I have for now. So um, I'm going to stop my share. And uh, thank you very much for joining us, e joining us this evening. And I uh, wish you all a good night. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Good, night. good night, everyone. Thank nice. you. Thanks, everyone. Take thank care. you. Nice to see all of you, finally. <laughs> Bye-bye.